Last time, we got a pretty fair hint that our heroes have landed in the middle of the Battle of New Orleans, the last battle of the War of 1812. Now, the United States and England had already signed a truce ending the war, but those guys way down in New Orleans... Way down yonder in New Orleans... Well, yes, actually. Communication lines were poor and slow, so as far as anybody down there knew, they were still at war. And what do you do when you're at war? Why, you kill each other, of course. That's what a British soldier is about to do to Doug. <laughs> Good thing he's a bad shot. He arrests both of them and brings them to his commander. The formal charge against you is conspiracy against His Majesty's Armed Forces espionage in time of war. Archie Bunker. Oops, I mean, Colonel Southall. It turns out there was something in the pockets of those buckskins. I have here two passes which were found on your persons, attaching you to General Jackson's forces and allowing you to pass through the American lines at will. Now I wonder who those buckskins belong to, where they are, and if they're really running around in the woods naked in the middle of a gun battle. In the control room, General Kirk has brought in a friend, an expert on the War of 1812 and especially this particular battle. He's a direct descendant of the colonel, and it's not something he's proud of. Yes, that's the seventh, all right. They wore blue facings on their red coats. That's the Butcher's Regiment. The Butcher? Well, that's what they called my ancestor, the good Colonel Southerl. And why was he called that? My ancestor led the Seventh into a bloody slaughter. He could have accomplished an easy maneuver and outflanked the American fortifications, defeated your Andrew Jackson. But he didn't. His unit was almost completely wiped out. He says, if your men are with that outfit, get them out of there as soon as possible. Especially now that they're tied to a couple of trees and looking down a bunch of rifle barrels. But Ray and Anne are having trouble getting a solid time lock on them and can't move them right now. You know, something just occurred to me that might soften matters a bit. There's no need for both of you to die. What do you mean by that? He says, the Americans captured one of my men. I could trade you for him. That way at least you get to live. It wouldn't work. The Americans won't trade for me. He's your man. Meanwhile, his captain has been making Tony the same offer. Is there um, anything I can do for you? Yes, untie the ropes and let me go free. He gets the same answer to his proposal. Release my friend, not me. Seems that each one is trying to outdo the other in self-sacrifice. Touching. Bring that one to my cabin. He tells Tony, the captain is going to put on your friend's buckskins and you are going to lead him on patrol to assess the strength of the American lines. You'll find their weak point and report it to me. If you aren't back by dawn, I shoot your friend. Tony couldn't even tell you what direction the American lines are, but at least they have a chance now. Now, there's a rocket signaling station. Where is it? Uh, right there, sir. Yes, there. Now, you'll be there before dawn. Your signal will give us our line of march. All right? Yes, sir. What's the matter? Have any doubts? Oh, no doubts at all, sir. Not about the directions, but uh, what about the American? Uh, do I bring him back here? The colonel says he's already been tried by a proper court and condemned, so once he's not useful anymore, carry out the order of execution. Are you as surprised as I am? Captain Hotchkiss is starting to wonder if Tony knows where he's going. Tony keeps hoping he doesn't learn the answer. Quick, into those bushes. Hurry, hurry. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure I heard him. You, scout the river. You and me will head back for the readout. You didn't know they had computer readouts in 1815, did you? A readout was a kind of fortress structure, usually made of earth, logs, wooden spikes, all that stuff. The stereotype fort in old cowboy movies with the pointy logs all around, that's also a readout. Why is it called a readout? Ask the French, they named it. The English and Americans pronounce it badly, and there you go. And Tony knows what direction it is. Follow those guys. That, too, is a readout, and it's the one they're looking for. And there's General Jackson standing right there within range of the captain's pistol. You won't shoot, Captain. Oh? You can't be sure of killing him from this distance. 
And you won't jeopardize your mission to take the chance for a little personal glory. Now, if you've seen enough, we'd better get moving. They're almost done scouting both flanks, and there's still some daylight left. Getting the captain back by dawn should be a cinch. Oh. We're Americans. I'll give the password. We're new to this area, Sergeant, but we have passes. They seem to be in order, but you'll have to come with us. Or not. Tony tries to bluff his way out of it, but Soldier Boy isn't having it. Come on, let's get this one back to Captain Jenkins. How good is your American accent, Captain? I am Captain Richard Huskis of His Royal Majesty's 7th Regiment. And I demand treatment according to my rank. That is the worst American accent I have ever heard. You'll never get a chance to use the intelligence you've collected. I can guarantee you that. All right, take him away. With an American accent like that, you wouldn't get 10 feet out of this place. However, with an accomplice who's coming back to spring you loose, you might have a chance. He's successful, though he has to surrender the musket to the captain before he'll leave. Well into the woods, the captain says, Okay, it's time to carry out your sentence. Now get behind that bush. Move! Why should he? What are you going to do if he doesn't? Shoot him? Bear in mind, this whole business from Plymouth Rock down to where Tony is now was the British exporting their civilized ways to the savages of the world. Those civilized ways included lying, cheating, stealing, breaking their word, murdering, enslaving, and otherwise exemplifying all the worst traits of humanity. So what is it about them that's so civilized that these savages would want to emulate? We wear shoes and have last names. Well, that's certainly worth destroying entire cultures for. What was I thinking? No need to be nervous, boy. We've all got to die sometime. Now get up. I do wonder where the captain was taking him and why he didn't just do the deed right there when he declared it. But his indecision means Tony has another chance. In the control room, General Southall is coming up with a crazy idea. He desperately wants to talk to his ancestor and try to reason with him. I want you to send me back there. It's out of the question. No, I want to talk to this man. I have to know what he was thinking. Why he butchered 500 men. I'm sorry, Phil, but the answer has to be no. For one thing, we can't bring you back. Suttle says, so what? I don't have any family or other connections here, and my military has basically put me out to pasture. If I can help save 500 lives by going back there and finding out why he did what he did, maybe the rest of my life can count for something. Kirk still says no. He forgets that a high-ranking British officer like Southall has many, many connections. He says, call your direct line to the Pentagon and ask them if they'll authorize it. In 1815, Colonel Southall is still trying to squeeze blood out of a turnip, which is to say he's determined that Doug is going to tell him things that Doug clearly doesn't know. Guess what is it? Uh, sir, the signal are outside, sir, awaiting your orders, sir. All right, come over here. Now, do you see that clearing? Sir. You will proceed with the signalman to that clearing and wait there for Captain Hotchkiss. If the regiment is to attack from the east, you're to fire a rocket in that direction. If from the west, you will so fire the rocket. Do I make myself clear? Yes, sir. All right, dismissed. So if you have the captain's report and the rocket signal, why do you need to try and get anything from Doug? Sounds like you're all set. He orders the lieutenant to assemble a firing squad, take Doug outside the camp and kill him. He's already explained his treachery regarding Tony, and since he has as much honor as a rattlesnake, Doug can expect nothing less. But I think both our heroes knew that the moment they met this guy. He's as civilized as a shark in a feeding frenzy. Meanwhile, the Pentagon has done what they frequently do, copped out and dumped it back in Kirk's lap. General Suttle says, there's also a chance I can save your man. I know the colonel and I can talk him into countermanding the order. 
Kirk really doesn't have a comeback for that. I'd be risking your life on the chance of saving his. No, I'm risking my life. What's left of it? Well, I told you. I'm on terminal leave. Translation, he's already dying, probably of cancer. If it was me, I'd want to go out doing something useful instead of lying in a bed waiting for the Grim Reaper, too. He's demolished every objection Kirk can come up with, so there's nothing for it. Give the man what he wants. <laughs> Something I've always wondered. Your target is one guy. Don't you have one sharpshooter who can do the job? Why does it take a whole squad taking careful aim to kill one helpless prisoner? Are they all that bad at shots? They need four guys on the assumption that one of them will hit the target? But right now they're not sure what the target is. Doug isn't going to hang around and ask questions. He runs off into the forest. You can't blame him. Well, where did you come from? Who are you? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. I'm Brigadier General Philip Southerl of the British War Office. And I want to see your commanding officer. Look, I asked you, where did you... Three, two, one. General Southerl, did you say so? Yes, I did. Yes, sir. Uh, will you come with me, sir? Certainly, after I've had a wash and tidy up. Oh, and that guy you just tried to shoot? Leave him alone, he's with me. Out in the forest, Captain Hotchkiss is still hunting Tony. But as Ra's al Ghul taught us, it's a good idea to mind your surroundings. Give me the musket. Help! Help me, somebody, help! Especially when you're standing next to a quicksand pit. Most such pits aren't that deep, but this one is deep enough. The captain is in serious trouble. Those soldiers won't find him in time, so Tony is his only hope. Tony says, I need you, so I'll save you, but not until you surrender the musket. Hotchkiss doesn't have much choice. Hold! The captain is appropriately grateful. I think it is only appropriate that you see the signal that will lead to the defeat of your army before I kill you. Kill him? But he just saved your life! Colonel Southerl gave orders to execute him. Now move him out. Yeah, soldier, you're witnessing the cream of the civilized British military. No honor, no decency, even to a man who just saved your life. Don't it make you proud to be part of it, young man? General Southerl is getting nowhere with his ancestor. The colonel refuses to believe he comes from the future. The general keeps saying, why do you intend to commit your forces against Jackson's strong right flank, contrary to all intel that you received? The colonel says, I haven't received any intel yet. I'm waiting for a rocket to tell me which way to attack. Then I'll decide. And fanciful jokes about official investigations are not to my liking. There will be an official investigation. Oh, really? And what, pray, shall I say? Your written statement in the course of that investigation will begin with an entry from your own field report, written in your own hand. He proceeds to recite the entire entry. Now he has the colonel's attention, because the colonel only wrote those words in his journal half an hour ago. There is no way anybody could have read them, much less committed them to memory. The colonel says... I intend to commit my forces to the side indicated by that rocket. History says he did the opposite. The rocket pointed east, but he attacked the west side and was decimated. Captain Hotchkiss has arrived with Tony at the rocket station and he tells them, point it east. Just then, Doug stumbles upon them. And now I intend to carry out my promise.
suggestion for these guys. In between crises, get to a gym and bulk up a little. Most of the time they need it. While they're fighting, one of the soldiers lights the rocket. Let's get out of here. No. No, you faced the rocket the wrong way. And one of history's little mysteries is solved. Kylo, the signal rocket! Well, where's the rocket? West! West? That means we attack Jackson's west flank. That's the weak side, or I'd give the order to march. Well, General, I still don't really believe anything about you, but if you like, you can march in the second rank. Thank you. Oh, by the way, I trust you heard my order to attack in accordance with the rocket. General Southerl has the answer to his lifelong mystery. The colonel didn't disobey the signal. The signal was wrong. Now the question is, why did the official inquiry say the signal pointed east? We won't get any answers to that one, but I have a feeling it was somebody down the line playing a little CYA. In the control room, they're going to try for a triple transfer, something nobody is sure the equipment can handle, but they have to give it a shot. but in our strong point. I hope you'll forgive me if I make a very old Bill Cosby reference. One of his most famous bits in the early days was the toss of the coin. He took the coin toss that they do at the start of football games and applied it to historical events. In this case, he had the settlers and the British. The settlers won the toss, so that meant they can wear any color clothes that they want to, shoot from behind trees and rocks and everywhere, and you guys must wear red and march in a straight line. That was pretty much how it played out, both in the Revolution and in the War of 1812. The British were still doing medieval-style battle, just line up and blast away at each other until one side gives out. By now, the Americans didn't play that game. That's part of the reason why the British eventually came in second. I have to wonder what those men on the first couple of lines were thinking as they approached all those barrels trained on them. And what about the bagpipers and drummers? Why do they have to be out front basically screaming, shoot me? They're not even armed, they're just cannon fodder. If I'm on the American side, I'm going to try to avoid hitting the non-combatants and focus on the guys with the muskets. But in a barrage like that, it's almost impossible. So foolish, so wasteful. If I'm in that brigade, I'm developing bone spurs that day. All Doug and Tony can do is watch. They can't leave because they know they have a third time traveler around here somewhere. I'm losing the signal for General Southern. Why is he losing radiation? There's only one explanation. I think he's dying. Which he was already, just a little more slowly and insidiously. The battle is over. Dead and dying British soldiers are everywhere. And what the hell is it all for? Why can't we humans ever learn? General. Yes, yes. The tunnel. Yes. Tunnel. And then the bullet. The tunnel was much more pleasant. He says, just in case the guys back in the control room didn't see all this, I want you to have them put something on the official record for me. Colonel Sutherland is not a butcher. He made honest error. He is misled by a rocket. I still have questions. By the time they got there, he should have been able to see that something was wrong. He could have held up the attack and sent messengers to find Captain Hotchkiss and double-checked the intel when he saw how strongly fortified that side of the readout was. He may have made an honest error in going to that side, but I think he compounded it by staying there and attacking. Then again, I'm in a nice recliner in 2019. He was on a stool in the mud in 1815. Right before he dies, the general says it was all worth it. He got to meet his own ancestor, clear a man's name, and witness history as it happened. 
Basically, he had the time of his life. <laughs> Why does the tunnel do that? How does the tunnel do that? Where do the clothes come from? Where do the other clothes go? How does it tie Doug's tie so perfectly? Did it dry clean his suit while he was wearing the other stuff? And is that ugly turtleneck really the best it can come up with for Tony? I know he was wearing it when he went in, but I would hope the tunnel has better taste than he has. <laughs> Assuming that guy is friendly, it looks like a nice tropical island. Nice hospitable place. With a nice tropical storm, I guess. Although tropical storms don't usually shake the ground. The first time I watched this when I was 13, I had a feeling I knew where they were. And I was right. Ah! Ah! They're in deep doo-doo. We wouldn't have a show if they weren't. Most everything about this episode is fictionalized, right down to we have it happening a day earlier than it really did. The only person I've been able to find who was real was Andrew Jackson, and he was on the screen for less than three seconds, so he doesn't count. Still, it was a good story, good characters, and who knew Carol O'Connor could do such a good British accent? Two, in fact. It's amazing how little British accents changed between 1815 and 1968.